Good morning, everyone. How you going? <laughs> Not bad. A little shaky. Yeah, yeah. But uh, hey, thanks for the invite, Jeff. Thanks for the invite uh, to come here. Uh, I've been here quite a few times. I was whinging about the cold this morning. A Canadian whinging about the cold. That's actually a pastime of ours, whinging about the cold. But uh, yeah, we're just staying outside of town. It was six degrees and in an old shaky farmhouse with a lot of drafts. So uh, nonetheless, but so I was invited to talk about CTF. And we've been doing it for about nine years, so 2010. And I didn't, kind of speaking to the choir, right? I didn't, I don't know how many people here uh, are in CTF or have CTF as part of their system or if they're transitioning. But I just want to talk about what we do quickly on CTF and then moving into a, a really unique practice, which is really simple, but is, uh, but is showing some really great benefits to what we're doing. So this is our uh, integrated pest management strategy. Uh, we tend to control a lot of pests at minus 42 with the wind chill. And uh, that stubble height was about three years ago. It was 450 mil stubble. So it was 16 inch tall and we were just jam packed full of snow. So that controls a lot of weeds, insects, diseases for us. So what I do is look to GRDC magazines for my integrated <laughs> pest management strategies while I'm working from the home office. So like I said, I'll talk about our CTF and uh, just review it quickly. I'll talk about fence row farming, which is what I want to focus on today. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it's proven to be a really unique, really simple, but highly beneficial um, part of our CTF system. So we live just here, uh, just about 150K from the Rocky Mountains, from Banff, uh, Lake Louise, and we get a lot of turbulent weather. So here we've got, we're at 1,000 meters. Uh, been six years fence row, nine years CTF, like I said. We have 400 mils of annual precipitation, about 200 of that falls in the growing season. But I like to say it goes either zero mils or 800 mils, so we average 400 mils. So it's just really turbulent, highly variable climate. There's a lot of turbulence from the mountains. So the mountains tend to trap all the rain and the snow, and then we get the warm and hot wind on the other side and dry wind. So we farm a 60% cracking clay soil. It's a vertisol, so there's only a few spots in Canada that actually have vertisol soils. Cracking clays, black cotton soils. You'll find pockets in Kenya, you'll find pockets in the Darling Downs, but uh, yeah, we farm a small pocket of vertisols in Western Canada. Our growing season is 110 days, so between, that's frost-free days, so between 90 and 120 days. And again, we've actually increased 20 growing, or 20 days in the last 50 years. So the climate is shifting, the, whatever the weather, weather is shifting, but it's not our daytime temperatures, it's our overnight temperatures. Our overnight temperatures in the last 50 years have increased, they're just a little bit warmer. Oh, so we've gained uh, that growing season, which is highly beneficial, believe it or not, bloody Canadians. It's going to benefit us for a while, that climate change, that, that shift in temperature, that shift in rainfall, because uh, it's very sporadic, but uh, we're benefiting by being able to grow different crops. We're starting to move corn into our areas. So we grow wheat, barley, canola, peas, fava beans, sometimes lentils, um, a bit of durum wheat, and yellow mustard, sometimes brown mustard. So our system... This uh, very attractive tractor up here uh, did have eight wheels. Uh, Tim Neal up in uh, Toowoomba, he convinced me that you could put uh, a Steiger on singles. So I bought that thing for 7,000 bucks. It had all the tires on at the time. Um, drove it for a year, dropped two lifters, took out an engine, three pistons. So $30,000 later of a motor job, I now have a $37,000 tractor. But I didn't mind cutting it up. So I've got some really handy uh, uh, father-in-law, so we brought that down to 121-inch centers. So we're a 30-foot system and 120-inch centers on the Steiger and the spray coop. Punch that out to 120 inches exactly, uh, 9750 John Deere, and it, uh, it's also on 120-inch centers. This up here is a 60-foot fast toolbar, side dress toolbar. So we've been playing around with injecting nitrogen between the rows in season, which has been beneficial, although Tough, tough to accomplish on a scale, but, uh, but actually quite effective and economically effective as well. Just being able to culture in nitrogen in season, that's flag leaf wheat. So GS39 and we're injecting 30 units of nitrogen just to top it up because it was a tremendous growing season. So we're able to do that on the CTF system. We're able to do that because we're so precise. So first year, we tried to figure out how we were going to go uh, side to side and get between the stubble, right? Inter-row sowing was the thing to do, uh, but we really, on 12-inch centers, so we're 30-inch centers, uh, time to time, 
So we, we didn't want a wide guess row, so we didn't want to go six inches in between each year. So what we did was move over three inches this way and three inches this way. So year one, we pull from center. Year two, we move over three inches with this, uh, yeah, with this plate here, this little hockey stick that we made. So we move over three inches, and then the third year, we move over three inches. So by year four, that stubble is completely gone. But what we found in our system, it actually breaks down a lot faster. So it doesn't hang around for that much longer. So by year three, it's gone. So now, come 2013, we decided instead of moving the three lots, we'll just move side to side, side to side. So we're just moving three inches each side every year. So the guest row is either 15 inches or it's either nine inches, that guest row in between. So it doesn't open up a bunch of channels for, for weeds to grow. So that's proven to be really, really uh, interesting, what we've been able to do. So here's the drill down here. It's a 30 foot concourse. It was 40 feet. We brought it down to 30. If you ever think of doing that, don't just buy a 30 foot because it was really, really painful. Uh, concords are really painful. Uh, their hydraulics are really complicated. A little liquid tank there. So first year, so first year of CTS, so it's 2010. And uh, you can see the stubble. You see the waviness of the stubble? You had all those, those areas from, uh, from the historical wheel traffic. You had lots of variations in, in density. So as those times, it's a time machine. So as your tines are ripping through, it's kind of jiggling around. By year three, it was like straight as an arrow. You could almost an arrow on a string down our stubble rows. So this is year one. By year three, our stubble rows were almost very, very true. So a little bit of dropping on the side hills, but it was always consistent because we were traveling in the same direction. This is a caster wheel. So we're a high magnesium soil, heavy clay. So again, that's just the caster wheel and what it used to do uh, to our soils. It would just lump them up. So you think about... Uh, traffic and the effects of traffic and what that does to your seed bed alone. Up here are our tram lines, year one. So cracking clay, that's exactly what you'll see just in our tram lines and on our headlands. So you won't see those cracks any longer. And we've had, we had 75 mils of rain this year. Um, and you won't see those cracks. Small fractures in the soil now, but all you'll find is down the tram lines and on the headlands where we drive, those big deep cracks. So you can imagine once we get into grain filling, grain filling time, which for us is late July into August, and it gets 35 degrees, you know, 18 hours of daylight. So that, that plant is pumping pretty hard. So when your ground starts to crack like that, it starts to tear apart all those root systems. So you'll see a crop go nice and beautiful, and it'll just crash. We don't get that crash anymore. We get that nice leveling out, beautiful grain fill, and really high water use efficiencies, what I'll talk about. So again, this is a 60% clay, 25 magnesium. So this is a sticky, nasty, what used to be a very difficult, still is or can be, a very difficult soil to manage. So this is down to a foot. So we have 30 centimeter profile. And look, this is after four years. So we're now into nine. After four years, that cracking clay, that self-mulching, that freeze-thaw cycle that everyone thinks cures everything in Canada, uh, it does help but you have to stop driving over it and undoing all the good that nature will do for it. So this is, a, again, heavy clay soil. This is our headland. So these were taken 30 feet apart. So nine meters apart, and this is my headland now. And I have to fix my headlands, and I don't know what to do yet. Um, we can talk about that later on. I'm going to quiz a few people, because it's just getting too dense, so either I rip the, the headlands. But again, that drastic change. This, this is very typical of soils next door and in the area. So just when you're trafficking 50 to 60% of your fields, there's traffic running everywhere, this is what ends up. So if you get timely rains, all is well. Without those timely rains, they get stuffed pretty quick. So this was a really interesting observation. So this is some of the poorest soil on our farm. It is still, sorry, it's still 3% organic matter. But uh, it's a, again, when it's eight months of winter, it doesn't break down that residue. So we, are, we can keep that organic, that carbon content a lot better than, than you guys can, just because of our winters. But some of the worst soil on the farm, 3%, but a, just a dense clay, this is underneath the caster wheel. So this is what we've been able to turn that soil into. This is what it used to be. And now you can see the porosity, the friability, just the, the, por the porous nature of it, the ability to absorb moisture when we need it and drain moisture when we need it is, uh, has been paramount to our system. But just this here, these are taken 30 centimeters apart, so 12 inches apart. That's just a caster wheel running over it for five years. So look, at, look how many caster wheels I have. 
So there's part of my system on the on the nasty soils. It's fine on the on the on the nicer soils where I have five or six percent organic carbon. But on the nastier soils, you can see just that little footprint. You wonder, like those casseroles, how much load can they possibly be carrying um, when the times are in the ground? But it's actually it's not benign. So it's something we have to figure out. We have to improve ten or twelve ply cultivator tires are just not the not the go anymore. So it's just. It, uh, we're going to change that once we upgrade drills. We'll move to better rubber on there. So this is what it comes down to, really. I mean, we've got great porosity. This was a test done. We were we were part of a group. Uh, there were seven of us, eight, eight in total at the end, where we looked at infiltration. We all did randomized, replicated traffic um, traffic trials inside of our CTF systems. So we just did a trafficked area four times, four replicates in each field, and then we did a CTF on the rest. And what we did was measure water infiltration. And you can see SL is me, Steve LaRock. So I've been in it the, the longest. And JC, Jamie Chrissy, he farms very similar soil type. So what we do is take basically one inch of water, 25 mil of rain equivalent, which is a peanut butter jar full of water, and a seven inch ring. Bang, that's, that's your 25 mils. It's an easy test to do. And then you start timing it. So we can move an inch of water, 25 mils, in six seconds. So we took it further. So we weren't at field capacity, but there was moisture in the soil. We took another inch. It was 10 seconds. Took another inch. It was 20 seconds. Took another inch. We went up to six inches, and we were able to drain that six inches in a minute and 26 seconds. So you think about floods and droughts. You think about heavy rainfalls. We can move that moisture away from the root zone and store it down deep so it doesn't stuff our peas. It doesn't stuff anything with shallow rooted or canola peas that don't, that don't like wet feet, all of a sudden we can handle those heavy rains without a lot of great effect on, uh, on production. So the one you can guess who just started uh, that year, <laughs> he, this is CTF versus random traffic. You can see he just started in the trial and look where his infiltration rates are. He's now down here uh, after four years. So made tremendous changes there. So what it's done, this is, uh, these photos were taken this year, it's building resiliency of all the things. CTF has created a resiliency that I don't know any other system can do. I really don't. No-till, everyone's doing no-till. I've got fields that are no-till for 45 years. Like their fathers are 85, 87, and uh, their sons who are in their fifth, late 50s, early 60s, they are farming the same land uh, that their father did and they've been no-till for that long. So that's just the baseline and then you add CTF, it just ramps it up just that much more. So here we have, that's a pea harvest, and we have a wheat harvest. So we had 75 mils of rain. Stored soil moisture might have been 50 or 70, somewhere in there. Might have been a bit more. But we pulled off a five-ton wheat crop of 75 mils of rain this year. Neighboring was three and a half to four. And those were, my neighbors are really good farmers. We, uh, it, was a, it took a year like this, finally. You never want a drought, and I, like, in a, I just needed something to test that system, and we really hadn't had any droughts since 2010 when I started. We had really good rains, it's been a really good stretch, but last year after 75 mils, canola was stuffed, like we were a ton, ton and a half. Normally we're up to three in our area for our rainfall, but uh, canola really took it on the chin, but we're, we're pulling three and a half ton peas, we're pulling five ton wheat on 75 mils of rain, where nobody else around would even touch that. So. They're paying attention. I've been doing it for nine years and have been driving by every year. But again, that complexity that they think is there with, uh, with CTF, um, it's, really, it's really shining now. So, so fence row farming, that's what I really wanted to talk about today. So that's my system. Fence row farming is really trying to mimic what our old fence rows are doing. The soil quality, the, the biology, the nutrition that is inside old fence rows. Are you familiar? Are you familiar when you pull up an old fence row and you, you farm across it, all of a sudden the moisture climbs, the yield climbs, and you wonder, okay, that's drift dirt and it makes sense. It must be deep, you know, just more topsoil, so therefore it's, uh, it's going to have more nutrition and higher yield, but it's not necessarily the case, and I'll show you. So what we're trying to do, because we're seeding in really straight rows, because we're able to move that, that hitch just three inches, so my time is a two-inch opener, so it's a two-inch side band opener, Places fertilizer down below, and then off to the side two inches is my seed with a liquid kit. And what I'll just do is move side to side each year. So I'm practically, because of that side band, I'm almost on or beside last year's stubble row every year. 
So I, well, that's what I'm trying to do is trying to build up a zone of nutrition, of biology, of aeration, and I'll show you what we're able to accomplish. How am I doing for time? 15? <coughs> 10 minutes? So that's the goal. Create a deep root zone, zone of, uh, of nutrition. Or nutrition of, <coughs> that's interesting. Okay, create, create a well aerated zone. We're just trying to mimic that, uh, that what we see in, in an old fence row. And this I stole from uh, Michael Ayers, he's a fairly local, but uh, yeah, it's about soil use efficiency. So we measure nitrogen use efficiency, we measure water use efficiency, we never measure soil use efficiency, which is just about where our roots are, where are they growing, are they in the top, are they in the bottom, are we maximizing the amount of surface area that, uh, that our roots are penetrating. And this is your typical no-till, which is great, but you can imagine in the 0 to 6 inch, 0 to 15 centimeters, 60% of your root mass is sitting in that layer. Well, as soon as that dries out, all that nutrition isn't available, right? So you get a little bit better down to 12 inches, so 30 centimeters, about 30% of your root mass drops off to eight at 45, say 16 inches, and then basically nothing down below. A few roots, stragglers, they'll go deep, but not many of them. So you move into a fence row, all of a sudden you don't have as many on the surface, you still have a great number, but all of a sudden you're punching a lot deeper so all that moisture that's stored down below, so it enables you to weather a lot more storms, it enables you to store a lot more nutrients, because if your roots are driving deeper, as they die off, as they decay, all that nutrition sticks down below, and all of a sudden that following crop, or the following crops, get to tap into that deep moisture, tap into those deep nutrients, tap into that biology. So that's what we find. So I, I took it to the test. I said, okay, let me test my old fence row. I've got a field that was farmed 50-50 for a number of years, and uh, with diskers, so there's a big headland, there's a big 10-foot chunk where it looks like there's higher, uh, yeah, you can just see the big hump, lots of drift dirt. So I just measured the organic matter, the pH, I measured the nitrogen, phosphorus. So it makes sense, here you have a fence row, I took a 0 to 5 centimeter, 5 to 15, 15 to 30, and just compared it 30 feet away. So it just went 30 feet away, and then the, uh, the fence row. So clearly organic matter is really high, still really high where I was. It was a, it was a good area of the field, you can imagine, uh, at 7.2 uh, organic matter. But pHs were a little bit lower, makes sense, a little more acidic. Uh, your nitrogen, your phosphorus, this is what's interesting, and this is where it builds resiliency. Because when you look at the phosphorus levels, these are in pounds, it could be parts per million, doesn't matter. Just follow the trend. So you can see down to 30 centimeters, we've got 21 ppm of phosphorus. You go into my traditionally farmed soils, 14.53, I'm down to three. So again, back to that resilience, back to that, that, that phosphorus and potassium when you need it the most during grain fill for trigger pressure, for yep, moisture use efficiency, you really get, gain that in those fence rows. So I wanna, I wanna mimic that, I wanna create that, and it is possible. So this is what caught my eye. So uh, when I was originally into row sowing, I found that this was probably the worst place to seed. Interrow sowing was the thing to do, but if you want to find the driest, the hardest, the hottest area in your field, it's right between last year's stubble rows. If you want to find the most moist, if you want to find moisture even in a dry spring, for us, even in a dry spring, you're not going to find it here. You're going to find it right there. You pull up, you pull up stubble, you'll find some moisture maybe even a little bit further below, but you'll find moisture and you won't find it. This is only 30 centimeter row spacing. And again, really dry and you'll almost always for us find moisture right there. So you have all that nutrition that's sitting there from my starter fertilizer in years previous. You have all that nutrition, you have all that moisture. So what we found, our germination and emergence, it was already good, we just amped it up. In Western Canada, the average canola emergence is 50%. We're paying $150 a hectare for GM canola seed, because pretty much everything is 90% GM. So you can imagine, $150 a hectare that we're paying for canola seed, and half of it doesn't emerge. Huh. So no one's looking to improve what they do. No one's, well, a few are, but it's just, you know, it's just five minutes. So it's just one of those things that, you know what, people take for granted, and what we've been able to do, I have had to back off my canola seeding rates since I went side since I went fence rolling, because my canola merge, that's ridiculous. I lost yield because that was too thick. On a year I should have done five ton, I did four. And that's still a great, still a great year, but it was a tremendous looking crop. So 
So root architecture. So that's what we've been able to do as well. We can pull, like, over here, that's a 16-inch root. So I'm able to just grab in and pull it because those canola roots, even the barley, wheat, peas, they're driving down into that fence row because all that aeration is now there. All those old root channels are sitting there. All that old nutrition sitting there. So we can pull it out really easily. And that's what it's done is changed, like, it changes the way those roots are structured. So instead of going out to the side, they just drive deeper and there's more of them and they're thicker. This is just the neighbors, the neighbors across the road, but a uh, bunch of sticks to compare. So nutrient loading, that's what it comes down to as well. So we're able to place those nutrients on just a small percentage of the field instead of randomly all over the field and diluting it. Super concentrate, row load if you would call it. Row load those nutrients right beside last year's stubble row. So fence row farming is not my term. There's a gentleman out of Ontario and he was planting corn and beans on top of the row for 20 years. And he says, after six years, I started to note a, differ a difference. Just yields were starting to increase for the same amount of inputs. So they did a study in Ontario, Dean Glennie and uh, George, Dr. George Lazarowitz. They looked at the biology. So they compared what his neighbors were doing versus what he was doing by strip cropping. So 30 feet of bean, corns, 30 feet of corn, 30 feet of beans. So alternate, row, alternate passes, and then just seeding right back on top. Corn, beans, corn, beans, corn, beans for 20 years. So you talk about monoculture. But what he did was create like a probiotic approach. So he created and selected for specific bacteria that were beneficial to corn and beans because he super concentrated those, uh, those bacteria that, and that fungi. So what they did was compare the two areas and what they found were 10 times the amount of biology in Dean's in the fence row farm versus the neighbors. But he, did, he wasn't as diverse. So he didn't have a diverse set of biology. He had very specific biology that were that were specific to corn and beans. And that's why he was up to 75% higher yielding on the same rainfall, same inputs, just different farming practices. So it just, it's one study and it's not, you know, it's just something we're looking to, to, to try and replicate. But this is where it gets interesting. So you think that there's added nutrition, better nutrition, but here's his soil, Dean Glennie's soil versus the neighbors. So you know what, his, this is wheat, just planted into a cup, neighbor soil, his soil. So they grew it out in a medium. And, uh, and this is what it looked like, right? So, yeah, it looks a bit better in bean soil. What they did, same soil, same, uh, same test, but they pasteurized it. So they heated it up to 60 degrees Celsius and pasteurized it. They, they nuked all the biology in both of those samples. No difference. There was no difference in growth, which tells us it was a biological response, not a nutritional response. So when you select, like you, do, you, like you can do in fence row, all of a sudden you get this biological response that we weren't expecting. But what it's also done, because he's in a canola and soybean rotation, this is canola in Dean's soil. It's not great. He doesn't have the right biology. He's not, he hasn't selected to grow canola, so it's very specific to corn and beans. So it may not be beneficial when you've got a multiple rotation. But inside of his system, it worked really well. So again, back to that biological response. So fence row farming, it's really about mimicking that old fence row and creating that biological response, you know, that nutrition zone, that point of aeration. One minute, perfect. Point of aeration. So really, we can do it. If I can do it on 30, 30 centimeter rows, if I can do it on 12 inch rows, I think anybody else can, even on 10. If we're just moving side to side, that's all we need to do. And we can do that mechanically. We don't need fancy protractors or maybe you, it might benefit in the hills, but really we're able to do it just by a simple hitch uh, change in that three-inch hitch. So thank you. That's my time.